Hi, my name is Dr. Joseph Walrath. I'm an oculoplastic surgeon. That means I do surgery with the eyelids, eye sockets, and tear drains. That's all I do. I don't do facelifts. I don't do breast lifts. I don't do butt lifts. I just do eyelid surgery, and I do a lot of it. Last year, about a thousand major surgical cases and countless other minor procedures. I spent a lot of training, uh, practicing and learning and perfecting my skill. I went to medical school at Columbia for four years in New York. Did four years of residency in ophthalmology in New York, two years in fellowship at Emory University dedicated to eyelid and eye socket surgery only. Last 12 years, that's all I do. I treat the full range of patients, reconstruction in children, reconstruction in adults, cosmetic surgery in adults. I look forward to helping you uh, with all your eyelid reconstructive or cosmetic needs. In this video, we're gonna talk about the basics of upper eyelid surgery. This video is an overview. It would go well with some of the other videos that talk about specific topics. This is gonna help us understand exactly what problem we need to correct. We're going to talk about different categories of droopy lids, and when a patient says droopy lids, we want to be more precise. We're going to talk about what the difference is between a medical procedure and a cosmetic procedure. We'll talk about what we have to do to prepare for surgery, how our post-operative course will go, and of course, we'll talk about the risks of upper eyelid surgery. When a patient comes to me and they say, Dr. Walrath, I have a droopy lid, I want to be more precise. I think of it in three categories. A droopy brow, I call this the curtain rod. Droop an extra lid, I call that the curtains. And a drooping lid itself, I call that the window. Okay. You can raise the curtain rod, you can trim the curtains, or you can open the window. Now in some people, you might need to raise the curtain rod and open the window. And other people, you may need to raise the curtain rod on both sides and open the window just on one side. There's no cookie cutter approach to everyone. Every patient's different. This is a picture of a patient who's halfway through a brow lift. This is raising the curtain rod. On her right side, you see the incision has been closed and the brow is elevated and the brow has a nice shape to it. The left side hasn't been done yet, but you see the marking where it's gonna happen. This is a patient in the operating room who's had half of a blepharoplasty. This is trimming the curtains. The skin between the lashes and the brow has been removed on the right side. Just the right amount of skin has been removed such that the eyelid closes properly. As you can see, it closes completely without any tension. The left side of this patient will be done uh, at the rest of the procedure. Finally, this is a patient who needs to have the window opened. This is called ptosis. Pro tip, silent P, called ptosis. Her left window needs to be opened. What's the difference between medical and cosmetic? A medical condition is when you take something that's abnormal and then you make it normal. That's medical. Cosmetic is when you take something that's normal and then you make it a different version of normal. That's cosmetic. Pragmatically speaking, medical is somebody else pays for it. Cosmetic, you pay for it. In general, when the lid tissue gets down to obscuring vision, it becomes a medical problem. What Medicare says is if the lid tissue gets down into your pupil, it's covered. And most commercial insurances have similar policies. My office is really good at working with insurance, whether pre-authorizing or whatever to help you navigate this. Who's a candidate for upper eyelid surgery? Pretty much if you can walk into my office, you can have upper eyelid surgery, okay? Most of the surgeries don't awake. If you can walk into my office while simultaneously swiping your credit card, you can have cosmetic upper eyelid surgery, okay? Age is not a consideration. Some patients say, I'm 90 years old, or their loved ones say, my, my mother is 85 years old. I don't think she should. It's not a big deal. You're awake for the surgery. It's not particularly invasive. We work with your medical doctors if there are any concerns. If you're on blood thinners, we'll work to make sure we can safely stop them or arrive at a good compromise position. We can negotiate the level of anesthesia. Some people say, I can't take any anesthesia. I'm scared of anesthesia. You don't need it. Do it in the office. Not that big a deal. Some people say, I need a little something. Fine. Do it in the operating room. Get a little something in the IV to 
make you calm. Your health can dictate the setting of the surgery. So for example, if you're on home oxygen, can't do that in the office, can't do it in a lot of surgical centers. Usually we do that in a hospital, day surgery center. You still go home, you know, an hour after surgery, not that big a deal. If you have a defibrillator or a pacemaker, those are uh, often done in a hospital surgical setting. A full list of preoperative instructions can be found on my website. Most patients have a pretty good experience. This guy here had such a good time, he wanted a group photo. Postoperatively, the first three days are pretty simple. Rest, ice, comfy chair. After that, for the next two weeks, light normal activity, stay in a clean environment, not a good time to do gardening, just take it easy, stay out of the dirt. After a week, take a jog, take a walk, just don't do any power lifting or anything too aggressive. Follow-up visits one to two weeks after the surgery could be telemedicine. And then if there's another need for a second follow-up visit a few months down the line, could be telemedicine, could be in office also. Most patients have very little pain with upper eyelid and brow surgery. Tylenol, Motrin for the first 24 hours, half the people don't have any pain. Long term, the upper blepharoplasty incision heals quite well. I've done this incision perhaps a thousand times in the past year. I revise about one of them because the incision is thick. That's pretty rare. Every now and then I inject a scar to try to speed along the healing process. That happens perhaps once every three months. There is risk to upper eyelid surgery. Now the upper eyelid has an excellent blood supply. It's very unlikely to get infected. In fact, I've never seen an infection from an upper blepharoplasty. Not true with ptosis repair. We'll talk about the specific risks in ptosis repair in a separate video. But this great blood supply really fights off infection of the upper lids. Now, on the flip side, every now and then you get a little too much bleeding. Once or twice a year, I get excess bleeding that delays healing. It does not have a functional consequence. The lid turns out just fine, but it may push the timeline back a week or so. Some patients can have a worsened dry eye with certain types of eyelid surgery. Upper blepharoplasty, not the case. It should not cause a worsening dry eye. Once again, this has been Dr. Joseph Walrath, and this is my team. I hope this video has helped you understand these oculoplastic topics. We look forward to seeing you and we'll strive to help you reach your goals, whether they're medical or cosmetic. I can't wait to get started.